Good morning. I'd like to use as a sermonic theme today, the promise of today, a subtitle, Bird by Bird. Ever waited to the last minute to do what you already had ample time to do? Ever procrastinated putting off something that with time you could have done an excellent job? Research shows that 25% of, of adults procrastinate, which I actually think is a low number. But 70 to 90% of college students procrastinate. And I couldn't find any statistics on youth, but I think 100% there. I remember the night before final term, one person said, I crammed all night trying to get prepared for papers. Most of you have been to college, know that they have all kinds of stations and support set up for kids staying up all night to cram before the end of final terms. I think today with entertainment and games and social media, we are given more temptation to procrastinate. Anne Lamont shares this story of when she was young. Her brother had his school project. He had been given a month to complete the project but the Sunday before the paper was due, he found himself with his pencils and books at the kitchen table facing the inevitable. He was doing his project on birds. He had a few books on the topic of birds. Up until this point, he had not cracked one of those books open or done any prior reading. The enormity of the task was now really, really hitting him. It had hit him before, which was how he had ended up in the position he was in now. But there at the table, with no more days left for him, and that awareness, he began to cry. Today in this text, the people are waiting for Jesus to return. And that return, that anticipation, becomes too much. He was only supposed to be gone for a minute. This community is anticipating Jesus coming back. When Paul writes his second letter to the church of Thessalonia, he is writing to a church that's totally focused on the second coming of Christ. They are consumed by it. They are possessed by it. Some of the members have even quit their jobs because the thought that the day of the Lord was upon them, they did not want to miss. It has become too much eating into their day, eating into their consciousness, exacerbating their worries. They are on 10. This is too much. Like Anne's brother sitting at the table, too much. There's a lot that's happening even now. I was reading this article this week on Ukraine and the title says, Can Ukraine Win the War? The title is already telling us something. There are actually two wars for me. There's the literal physical war, but then there's another war where a group of people, a country stands up to a bully because of the principle of the matter. Putin's leadership, too much. From day one, watching this war has been too much. The lives that have been impacted, too much. Wars all over the world, too much. What is happening to civilians who want just a chance to live in liberty, fleeing their own countries, too much. Our elections are too much. The slander in the media, too much. The running on personality and narrative versus truth and values, too much. So if you haven't voted, please vote on Tuesday. Remember, vote. The turning back of Roe versus Wade, too much. Tupac, decades ago, uttered the prophetic words, and since a man can't make one, he has no right to tell a woman when and where to create one. Sounds good to me. Too much. Stripping away choice on a federal level, too much. The rumors of legislating who gets married to whom next on the agenda, too much. Capitalism that rewards greed and selfishness, too much. 
social media too much, social media cookies following us around too much. Alexa doesn't go to sleep too much. And Twitter under the new leadership of Elon Musk too much. The urban context too much. I'm on the phone with my family from the country, fire trucks and police sirens and cars crashing. And yesterday I stopped to go to my place to get a hot beverage and I see a woman getting out of her car and she announces to her spouse sitting in the passenger seat, I'm not doing this with you anymore. And she walks away from the car too much. I lived two doors away from someone who had a gun pulled on him at 7 a.m. in the morning going to his car too much. Even in our home, we can't get away from it too much. Parents walk up to me this week. One parent walked up to me, walked up to this, me this week. We were dropping off our kids at school, and he said, how are you managing the crazy? And I started thinking to myself, what, which part of the crazy are you talking about? Too much. Too much. I took a brief detour on Facebook yesterday, and one of my high school classmates was wishing her dad a happy birthday. And there on the page was a recent picture of the whole family with a nice big old Confederate flag hanging behind them. For some, not all that flag is emotionally triggering. Without one bit of sensitivity, here she was posting for the whole world to see her family, her Facebook friends. For a moment, I wondered, should I defriend her? It could have been a Nazi flag. It could have been a supremacist flag. She was proud and saw absolutely nothing wrong with the Confederate flag. Too much. Too much is when we get overwhelmed by what is happening around us, when the skills in us feel completely inadequate to handle our lives, when our cup is dry and we are parched, when the weight of life is more than our bodies can endure, when the problems on our plate are beyond our ability to digest, when the things we care about and the ones we love pull at our mental and emotional well-being too much. Are you with me this morning? Too much. So Paul lets this community in on a secret. Jesus is not coming now, and he tells them why. So you all need to relax, he says. That day is somewhere in the future. Get back to doing what you were doing all along. What ultimately matters is our relationship with Christ, our here and now, what we do today. There is one self-help guru that says to stay in the future is to be anxious. When is Christ coming? How will my life end? Do I have enough to live off? To stay in the past is to get left behind. But the most relaxing and powerful place we can be is right here, right here in the present. Sometimes we even come to church and we're fast forward in the future. We're back in the past, but we're not here. Right here. Look or think about your loved ones. Enjoy your friends. Enjoy your grandchildren. Crack open that bottle you're saving for a special day. Do something for someone else and do something for yourself. Today, we have arrived at turning in our pledges. Yay! Can I get a hallelujah? Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Today is the day. In a few minutes, we will put our pledges. Our leaders will lead us by example. I'm so glad that my leaders will lead by example. You can pledge any amount from 50 cents to $1,000 a month. As long as you've thought about it, you've prayed about it, and you've checked in with God about it. Over the past couple of Sundays, we've heard testimonies about what people are doing, what's happening in our church. You have heard leaders share their journey. We have a picture right here of seeds planted and harvest. We have been invited to think about what do we want for our church moving forward. Tomorrow we will live into our commitments, but today, right now, we want you to enter into this day. Make your pledge and honor your commitment. A lady who was very sick came to one conclusion when she got better. Moving forward, she said, every day is a gift. 
Do you really feel that? Sometimes it may not feel like that. But every day that you wake up, every day you put your feet on the ground, no matter all the problems that are there with you, it is a gift. Can you guys be here with me right now? For five more minutes, because I'm coming around the corner. This moment we share together today is a gift. Today I got in church just early enough to watch you guys walk in, to see you come in. And as each of you entered, stories followed you. I remembered things about each one of you. I could feel your sacredness and your journey just to come here to church. It was getting close to that time and Marsha was wondering if you were gonna come. It's like, is she coming? And then almost near service, because she shared a lot about her journey last week. She started walking down the aisle slowly. We are here as a community of faith and we are stronger together than we are apart. We are stronger as a body of Christ. We are the United Church of High Park. And we took many roads to get here. And I'm talking about our journey. Thank you, Lord, for this gift. Thank you for the gift of today. I'm not aware that some of you guys are facing some stuff, but thank you in this moment for this day. Thank you for this journey. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us together. Thank you for the promise of this day. So Anne Lamont says her brother dropped his head and cried and cried, and eventually their father walked in. Her father patted her brother on the back, looked at the supplies on the table, looked up for a second, and then her father looked at his son and called him to attention. He could have said, son, why did you wait to the last minute? That's my favorite line. He could have increased the child's anxiety. He could have done it for him. I've seen some parents do that as well, reach in and help finish the project, really doing most of the project themselves. He could have joined his son in becoming overwhelmed by the task. But the dad does none of that. He said, son, we will do this project bird by bird. He made the enormous task manageable. Let's just start with one bird. Amen. <laughs>